Hey everybody, uh, my name is Ben Nelson and I built my own electric motorcycle and I'd like to show you how I did that. Um, some presentations at, at various events, sometimes they're, they're kind of uh, a general. Here's, here's an overview of solar energy. Um, that's not what this is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I built a real world practical application. Um, what I think is a fantastic vehicle. It doesn't use any gasoline, zero. It's all electric, uh, it's rechargeable, it runs on uh, renewable energy, and it's something I've been very, very happy with. Now, a lot of times people say, well, why would you even build an electric motorcycle? When I was a kid, <laughs> I saw a movie, it was called Tron. Now, my family, it, there are a lot of I, I've got a lot of siblings. We didn't have a lot of money when, when growing up. So when we did get to go to the movies, it was the drive-in movie theater because you could go for a, a, a car load price. So I was packed in the back. And this, this was the second movie. And I was, I don't know, seven years old or something. So staying up till midnight to, to watch this movie. This was very exciting. And it was also the first film that I ever remember seeing that had computer graphics in it, which was another, oh, it's such a cool, super thing. And uh, check this out. This, this was the light cycle I always liked. Um, notice the color. <laughs> now, my motorcycle does not make right angle turns, and it doesn't leave an energy barrier behind it to destroy the, the enemy motorcycle riders. Other than that, they're nearly identical. <laughs> um, but, but people ask, okay, well, what was your motivation? You know, what drives you? And for me, a big part of it was eco-friendliness. Um, my first car got 47 miles per gallon. Every car I've had since then has gotten worse fuel economy. It's gone downhill and downhill. And the last vehicle before this one got 26 miles per gallon. I could not do better than that no matter what. It was a completely unremarkable vehicle other than I paid 100 bucks cash for it and put 100,000 miles on it <laughs> and then sold it for $600. But uh, an electric vehicle is amazingly eco-friendly. They're just fantastic vehicles. And another thing is I live on a corner property and it's a 25 mile an hour road and a 45 mile an hour road and the motorcycles go 65 miles an hour over the hill and downshift in front of my house. I don't mind the cars. I don't like the semi trucks downshifting and I don't like the crotch rockets flying by way too fast in a blind spot. Uh, but electric motorcycles are very quiet. Now they're not silent. They'll make noise. I've got a horn on there. <laughs> You'll hear me coming. It's, it's bright yellow. You'll see me coming. I painted it school bus and taxi yellow. Uh, another thing is that electric vehicles are really cheap to run. We're talking like a penny a mile for a motorcycle. A lot of cars, about two cents a mile. Cheap. And then on top of that, there's no oil changes. There's no air filters. Um, there's a lot of uh, cost savings in terms of the maintenance as well. And keep in mind, electric motorcycles are fun, fun, fun. Motorcycles are fun. Electric vehicles are fun. You put them together and you've got a really great time just waiting to happen. Another question asked, uh, people ask me is they say, well, I'd like to build an electric car, but you know, that looks really complicated. And you know, what, what do I do in the winter for heat? And I don't have a lot of room in, in my garage. So a motorcycle is better than a car for a couple of reasons. Um, a big part of it is that it doesn't need a lot of things that a car does. Um, a lot of home conversions of electric cars typically keep the transmission. Motorcycle doesn't need that. Um, I live in Wisconsin. People ask me, what do you do for heat in the winter? Well, I did come up with a solution for that on my electric car, but for the motorcycle, who cares? It's summer. <laughs> motorcycle doesn't have a heater. It doesn't have air conditioning. It doesn't have power steering. It doesn't have power brakes. Nothing to worry about. It's a really small and simple vehicle. Um, let's say you want a nice second vehicle. You know, you don't want to give up your gasoline car, but you'd like to drive something more eco-friendly as much as you can, you know, when the weather is nice and when you're going to and from work, a uh, motorcycle is, you know, you can still cram that in your garage. You got a little space for it. It's easy to work on. This is not new technology. Um, electric vehicles have been around for well over 100 years. In the year 1900, there were more electric vehicles on the road than gasoline vehicles, and that includes motorcycles. Um, the one on the right is in the Porsche Museum in Germany. The one on the left is, believe it or not, steam-powered. <laughs> Imagine having a steam-powered high-wheeler bicycle like that. Woo! 
And they had some great advertisements back then too. Um, tandem electric bicycles, they show one electric bicycle jumping a gorge with amazed canoeists looking up, oh look at that, it's just so amazing. Um, advertising hasn't changed too much. But let's get into um, actually building an electric motorcycle. And the first thing, this is not from scratch project. I would have no idea where to start in terms of like welding together a frame, getting all the parts. I don't know, that sounds complicated, but I can spend $100 to buy a beat up old frame of a motorcycle. And one of the most important things on there is it has a VIN number, which means I can register it. It means it's easy to insure. It means when somebody asks me what make and model and year vehicle I have, I've got a nice straight up answer. Depending on where you live, you can uh, title insure and register a completely made from scratch vehicle, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So this is a great shortcut to having an electric vehicle without having to go through a lot of red tape. Now this is a, a it happens to be a 1981 Kawasaki KZ440. 440 is the engine displacement in uh, cc's. Um, so it's, it's not a real big motorcycle, it's, it's kind of medium size. Also it's a, a standard type of a motorcycle. That's the type of motorcycle I like. Um, I could have converted a sport bike, a crotch rocket. Um, insurance is a little cheaper on this. And also insurance, um, it's a year engine displacement and style of motorcycle. So this is also very affordable to be able to insure. Um, one of the first things you are going to do to build an electric motorcycle is something called de-icing. Ice means internal combustion engine. Basically, you're going to take out all the parts that you're not going to need anymore. That's going to be the engine, the transmission, uh, the oil filter, um, anything petroleum based on there, uh, air filter, all that stuff. You don't need it anymore. Take it out and sell it and make your money back. Um, this motorcycle had a non-working engine and transmission, it rusted solid, and I still sold that for 36 bucks. Uh, the only thing you want to check on is that um, depending on where you live and your registration, you're going to want to uh, write down the serial number that's on the engine and transmission. Sometimes for registration, they need to make sure you don't have like stolen parts on there, that sort of thing. So you want to, any additional identifying marks on the motorcycle, you want to write down before you sell any of those parts. Uh, the other thing you want to do is uh, mark where the drive sprocket is. So where the chain goes to on the motorcycle, and in this case, that's right here. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just take a ruler and write on the frame, scribe or somehow mark on the frame where that is because it's important that that's where the chain goes. And when you're going over bumps, the back of the motorcycle is going up and down like this. And if you don't have um, the electric motor in basically the same spot as where uh, the drive output from the transmission is, the chain is going to tighten and slack as you go over bumps. So you want to put your electric motor in the same location that the transmission was. So uh, all you have to do is mark that on the frame. Now we start getting into the good stuff. This is the electric motor in my car. And there's actually two of this exact same electric motor here at the fair today. There's a small three-wheeled electric vehicle inside here, back over here, that has the exact same motor in it. And then also out front where we have a couple of electric vehicles on display, there's a lawnmower with this exact same motor in it. And it's not out of anything. Uh, this was not a recycled part. Uh, it's a motor that was designed for the hobbyist market. It was designed for people to use to build electric go-karts and all sorts of different neat things like that. It was made by Briggs & Stratton. Uh, it's called an E-Tech motor. This one's designed for 48 volts and 150 amps continuous. Uh, a couple of things we need to know about electric motors. There's, there's two different types, AC and DC. AC is alternating current. It's the type of power that comes out of your wall outlet at home. DC is direct current. It's the type of power you get out of a battery where there's a positive and a negative mark on there. Uh, a permanent magnet motor is a motor where, um, well, the basics of how an electric motor works is you have two, electro, two magnetic fields that push against each other. And through that process of, of pushing and pulling, they spin the shaft on that motor. In a permanent magnet motor, one of those sets of magnets are magnets, like would stick to your fridge, magnets. And the other one is uh, an electromagnet. On other types of motors, like a series-wound motor, 
both the magnets are electromagnets. Now what's neat about a permanent magnet motor is they can be very compact. Uh, motors are rated in amperage and voltage. Uh, the main thing is amps is oomph. The higher is better in terms of being able to burn rubber or really accelerate up a hill. Uh, volts, um, main thing to know about that is that's going to kind of depend on like how many batteries you want to be able to use. Typically higher voltage is going to equal more speed on a DC motor. So what I did is I'm using a permanent magnet pancake style motor and it's DC. Pancake just refers to that it's really skinny. It's uh, about the diameter of a large coffee can and maybe about that thick. So it's an appropriate size to fit easily into, um, into a motorcycle. Now what we have to do is mount the motor to the motorcycle. So what I did for that, um, I just bolted it together. This whole motorcycle was basically built with a, with a socket set. Um, I didn't know how to weld. I didn't want to weld anything to the frame. I figured those, those Kawasaki welders did a great job putting together this motorcycle frame. I wasn't going to try to mess up what they did. So I did a bolted mounting plate. Basically, I took some scrap aluminum plate uh, and took the motor, marked where the holes were on the face of the motor, drilled the holes through there, drilled a hole for the shaft of the motor to go through, and then I put bolts through those holes into the face of the motor. So the motor is solidly connected to that plate. Now you'll see there's a couple of uh, bolt holes around the edge there as well. Those are tabs, and that's the part that's going to connect to the frame of the motor. So uh, I know it's a little bit dark here, but on the right, we can see over here, um, that's threaded rod going through the original mounting points on the motorcycle frame. So when you take the engine and transmission out, all the places where it bolted to the motorcycle frame, that's just holes. So I just reused those holes uh, rather than drilling new ones in there. So this motorcycle actually doesn't even have any uh, holes drilled into the frame. I just reused uh, the, the natural mounting points. The other thing that does is that puts the motor and the batteries in the same place that the engine and transmission was. So the balance of the motorcycle is the same and the center of gravity on the motorcycle is the same. Here's a little bit different view with the motor actually in place. So you can see right in the middle, you're looking straight at the end of the drive shaft of the electric motor and those four bolts are what hold the motor directly onto the plate. Here's a top view and at the top of this photo, you can see that's one of the power connectors for the electric motor. There's two power connectors on there, one's positive, one's negative, and I had no idea which is which. So kind of the first time with this, I'm like, boy, it's going to go really fast in reverse if I got this backwards. <laughs> so uh, bench testing with just a 12 volt battery and jumper, table, jumper cables, I tested to see which direction the motor would spin. And this particular type of motor will spin equally well either direction. Um, so when I knew which, which direction I needed it to spin, I took a magic marker and I wrote a plus next to the one connector where I was going to put the positive end of the batteries. So here's the motor from the other side and you can see it's uh, basically in the, the exact same location that the transmission was previously. We're looking from the right side of the motorcycle right now and the sprocket is on the left side. This motorcycle is a, a left side chain drive. And here we are with uh, the controller and the batteries in place. So you can see how it kind of all goes together. Now a different way to do this would be to weld something up. Uh, this is a uh, motorcycle belongs to a friend of mine. It is a older Harley Sportster, but it's electric now. So he calls it the Sparkster. <laughs> and he did something a little bit different with his motor. It's a very similar motor. It's a little bit bigger. He mounted it instead of where the transmission would have been, he mounted it kind of up under the seat and that does cause a little bit of a problem which I'll show you in a couple of minutes here. But what he did is he literally just welded a plate to the frame and see with my threaded, um, the threaded rod with the nylac nuts that are on there, I can adjust the motor. I can slide it back and forth. So to line up the sprocket of the motor with the sprocket on the, the wheel, um, I, can, uh, I can adjust that back and forth. Now what he did here was he added some slots so that the motor can slide on the mount just a little bit. And I'll show you just a couple other views of this. Here you can see the motor back behind and you can also notice the chain is kind of up high going down to the rear sprocket. Now the problem with that is every time he'd go over a bump 
that that chain is going to try to stretch and go tight and slack and tight and slack. So what you'll notice here in the upper left, uh, normally there'd be a big spring there that would connect the, the rear wheel to the frame of the motorcycle. There is no spring there. This is a hard tail motorcycle. It goes over bumps, bumpily. <laughs> Very much so. I love the suspension on my motorcycle. This is kind of neat though, since his, um, since his motor is back further, it gave him a little bit more room and he was able to put more batteries in. And batteries is the next thing that we're going to cover, because when we have an electric motor, we need a power source for that. On the left is an Optima yellow top battery. That is a battery I walked into a store, I put four of those in my shopping cart, boom, I had batteries. Um, people always ask about lithium ion batteries or they say, oh, batteries aren't good enough. They're, they're coming, they're not here yet. I, we, we can't make vehicles with off-the-shelf batteries. Well, I went and got some batteries off the shelf. They work great. Uh, and that's an AGM battery. It's a spiral-wound AGM battery. The battery on the right on the Sparkster, that's called a sealed lead-acid battery. Um, and he has five batteries in there, and I have four batteries in my motorcycle. In general, the more batteries you can get in there, the better. You know, you can go faster, you can go further, but with a motorcycle, you're limited in how much space you have. You know, you want to keep everything inside the frame, you want it compact, you want everything bolted down nice and secure and solid. Um, so the space is one of the main considerations on a motorcycle, just fitting everything in there. So what you need to do is have a battery rack, and that's going to be what holds the batteries in place, what holds everything together. Originally, I literally just bolted the batteries to the frame. I got some Unistrut, which is sort of a C channel. It's very inexpensive to buy at a, at a home improvement store. I cut a couple of pieces. I kind of sandwiched the batteries in with some threaded rod and a couple of nylock nuts. And it worked very well. It didn't look so great, but it, it worked just fine. So you can build an electric motorcycle without needing to know how to weld. You can literally bolt something together. Now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm rebuilding my motorcycle. I want it to look cool now. I want it to look good. And I've started to learn how to weld. I got some friends, they have welders, and yeah, sure, I'll show you how to do it. So this is a battery rack I'm working on. And the tabs that are on here all line up with those existing mounting points that are on the motorcycle. So all the weight of the batteries is connected directly to the frame in the same places that the engine and transmission uh, traditionally had been. Um, here are some little pieces of uh, steel pipe welded onto the side of that with some threaded rod to hook them all together. And here's the battery rack on the Sparkster. Um, it looks really nice. Um, the thing is on here, this guy paid a welder to do that for him. I'm doing everything myself. Um, it's a good way to save money and it's a great way to learn. I just wanted to show you the previous um, bolted together version of the battery rack. Um, so there, it was, it's uh, just some C-channel, um, it's bolted together to the frame. Doesn't look real pretty, um, a little paint would help. The other thing I didn't like was that the batteries, the, the top front two were kind of side by side, they were really wide. I was always a little worried about like smacking my knees on them or something like that. And one thing that's really neat about these Optima yellow top batteries is you can mount them pretty much any direction. They're sealed. Now a flooded battery has, uh, electrolyte in it, uh, battery acid or water, however you want to look at it. Now, a motorcycle only has two wheels on it. And if you let go of it and you don't have the kickstand down, something that's going to happen is it's going to fall over. And I was kind of thinking, if I've got flooded batteries and this motorcycle falls over, that's probably not going to be a good thing. So I went with these sealed AGM batteries. And because I could mount them sideways, that allowed me to reconfigure the batteries to fit them all much more nicely inside the frame. It's a more compact design that I'm going with now. Now you're probably all familiar with the basics of electric motors and you know what a battery is. Everybody's got one of those in the car. This is a motor controller and you might not know what this is. Um, it is a device that controls the speed of the motor uh, and it, it's what you connect between the motor and the batteries. Uh, it controls your speed and power. Um, it's going to be rated for voltage and amperage. This one is rated at 300 amps, 48 volts. I've got four batteries, four 12 volt batteries, makes 48 volts. Um, and this is rated at 300 amps, which is a pretty good amount of power. I mean, you can arc weld with 100 amps. Uh, 300 amps is me beating your gas car away from a traffic light. That's what 300 amps is. Now, it's not designed to do that continuously. 
I mean, the motor is only rated for 150 amps continuous, right? Now, this motorcycle is geared up so that when I'm zipping along, I might be using 75 amps. But if I twist the throttle, I can go to 300 and zoom, off I go, just like that light cycle we looked at at the beginning here. Uh, here, I'm showing the, the motor controller where it's mounted um, kind of just in front of and under the seat. Uh, 300 amps, plenty of oomph for a motorcycle. Another thing about amperage is the higher amperage the controller is, the more you're going to pay for it. Um, the other thing about a motor controller is, although it's the most complicated part in the motorcycle, there's one of these in every electric golf cart in the country. You can go to a golf cart shop and buy one. You can get them cheap, used on eBay. Um, 40, I mean, 48 volts, that's what most golf carts run on. So you could literally take apart a golf cart and build an electric motorcycle out of it. Except a golf cart might be able to go 20 miles an hour, and an electric motorcycle, you can make go pretty darn fast. Um, basically, the fastest drag racing vehicle on the planet right now is an electric motorcycle. It has uh, some amazing acceleration. Um, what's really impressive about it is it goes 0 to 60 in under a second. I don't know how many G's that is, but it's, um, it, it's like astronaut training. Uh, basically, the, the, the pilot of this electric motorcycle is on there like this, and they hit a switch and shoom, it, go, it teleports. It's, it, it teleports. He's already at the other end, and you're just looking at an empty spot at the starting line. It's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing about voltage is that the higher the voltage, the faster you can get your motor to spin. But we're also limited by the physical space of how many batteries we can cram in here. So I got a 48-volt controller. Every once in a while, I wish I had bought a 72-volt controller, because a 72-volt controller would also let you do 48 volts but it would be easier to add another battery or two if I wanted to. So even though all the space is taken up in the frame of my motorcycle, potentially I could put saddlebags on there, put one battery in each of the saddlebags, have a 72 volt motorcycle and be able to go 75 miles an hour. Now, I live on a corner property, 25 miles an hour on the one road, 45 miles an hour on the other. Do I need a motorcycle that goes 75 miles an hour? Yes. <laughs> You guys got to look up the kill a cycle. That's, that's, that's a fun one. Um, actually, in all seriousness, one of the next projects I want to do is a dragster. I want to build an electric vehicle that will beat the pants off gas vehicles built completely with junkyard parts. There's some great, there's some great cars out front. There's, um, I don't know if you guys know what a Tesla Roadster is. You've seen those? Oh my god, it costs as much as my house. <laughs> Well, actually, I used to say, oh, it's a great car, but it costs as much as my house. And then I went for a ride in one, and now I say, well, it costs as much as my house, but oh, man, is it a nice car. <laughs> Talk about teleportation. Oh, man. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go for a ride in one, it's uh, quite a bit of fun. Um, so the controller I went with was a 300 amp, 48 volt, Alltrax Axe programmable controller. Um, Alltrax and Curtis are two very popular brands. You can mail order these from electric vehicle parts distributors. You can buy them on eBay, lots of places you can get them from. You do want a controller you have uh, that you can tweak the settings on. In some controllers, it's uh, the settings, you, you stick a screwdriver into a little potentiometer and you change it. On mine, is programmable with a computer. You plug a computer cord into it, it comes with this little program, and you can change the settings. You can say, when I twist the throttle, go fast really quick, or when I twist the throttle, um, kind of ramp up the speed, but do it really smoothly. Um, and it's neat to be able to just change how a vehicle performs by going click, click, click like that. That's something that's not very easy to do on a gasoline vehicle. This is my electronic throttle. When I got the motorcycle, there was a lot of rust on it, and the original throttle on the motorcycle was wrecked. And normally, that would go to a cable, that would go to a carburetor, adjust how much gasoline goes in. What we need to do is control the current between the batteries and the motor, and that's what the controller does. But how do we send a signal to the controller? We do that through the throttle. This is really just a potentiometer, and a potentiometer is a variable resistor. There's a couple of wires there. You just use two out of the three. Uh, you slide that onto the handlebar, you tighten down a screw, and you crimp two little connectors onto two of those wires, you plug that into the controller. Now, this motorcycle no longer has a transmission on it, and it no longer has a clutch. So all I have to control the motorcycle is about a 90 degree twist here, instead of the clutch and, and five speeds. So right away it was a little touchy. I would 
barely twist the throttle and I'd be peeling away from a stop sign and that, that's, that's not necessarily what I wanted. So I plugged in the computer, pro, the computer cable and I said, hey, okay, well, give it just a little tiny bit of delay when I twist it. Or if I go over a bump and I kinda, <laughs> kinda do that, yes. well, the first time out, I kinda go <laughs> and that's not an enjoyable way to ride a motorcycle. So I plug in my, my computer cord, I change a little setting or two, hit save. Now the funny part is a lot of people have laptop computers nowadays. I didn't. My computer was in the house and the motorcycle wasn't. So what I had to do was drive around the side of the house and then run a computer cord out the window and down to the motorcycle and boy, that, that cord was just exactly long enough and I'm, I'm glad because I, I would have had to do something different otherwise. Now, if your motorcycle still has a good uh, twisty throttle on it, going to a cable, this is a different style of a throttle. This is popular for use in electric cars. It's still a zero to five kilo ohm potentiometer, but it's the type you would have a cable go to. And when you twist the throttle, it's gonna pull that little lever that's spring loaded, and you would have that mounted probably down under the seat somewhere near the controller. So just a different way of doing it, but that would let you use your original throttle instead of a, a dedicated electronic one. Uh, it's not programmable. It's, uh, the, the throttle itself is nothing that complicated. It's just a thing you twist and it, it changes a resistance signal. The throttle was a mail order part that was about 50 bucks. That one is a Magura brand twist grip. It's a very popular item. You can get those from uh, online scooter parts companies. Uh, the battery charger for this motorcycle there's a couple ways you can go with a battery charger. Um, pretty much everyone's familiar with a 12 volt battery charger. Usually it has kind of those big alligator clips. You put it on your battery, you plug it in, and um, you're charging your battery. Well, there's four of these. Um, do I want four battery chargers? Potentially. You know, there are some pretty small battery chargers, and you could put one small battery charger on each battery. You could put them into, like, say, a power strip that might be up under the gas tank, because we don't need gas in that anymore, so you may as well chop the bottom off of it and use it as sort of a fancy cover instead of uh, 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 for holding petroleum. Uh, the charger on the upper left, that is from a online scooter parts dealer. That is a 48 volt charger. Chargers don't just come in 12 volts. You can get them in other voltages. And again, things are gonna be rated in amps and volts. So we're gonna get a 48 volt charger. Uh, the two chargers on the bottom are uh, our 72 volt chargers would be appropriate for a 72 volt six battery electric motorcycle. Now on the upper right there, that is not a battery charger. That is just a connector that happens to be sticking out of the gas tank. That's designed for an off board charger. Some 48 volt chargers are kind of big. So why would you drag it along with on your motorcycle? You leave it in your garage. You have a quick disconnect uh, connector like that on there. When you get back home, you park your motorcycle in your garage and you just plug into the gas tank just like that. So that saves you some weight and some space on the motorcycle. Uh, typically, um, we're gonna have a rate of charge. People always ask, how long does it take to charge your electric vehicle? That's kind of like asking how much a house cost. You know, it, it depends. What are you looking for? Something big, something small, something fancy. Um, but typically, all you do is you take the capacity of the batteries and divide typically by 10. So my batteries are rated in 55 amp hours. If I divide by 10, I get five amp hours. Um, so if I had a five amp, let's see, if I have a five amp battery charger, it's gonna take 10 hours to recharge the batteries. Now that's worst case scenario though. That's assuming you totally ran down those batteries and usually you don't wanna do that. Typically you wanna run the batteries down, you know, halfway, something like that. So no matter how many batteries you have, your vehicle is always gonna recharge in eight hours or less. So if you're at work all day and you can plug in, you can recharge it. You get home at 10 o'clock at night, you plug it in, you go to sleep, you wake up and it's charged up. Um, so typical, typical to most vehicles, it's gonna be, uh, you know, like eight hours or overnight charging. It's like a cell phone. You know, at the end of the day, you take out your cell phone, you set it on the counter, you plug it into the charger, and the next morning it's charged up. You don't, nobody ever says, how long does it take to recharge the cell phone? It's just really not an issue. Um, one of the things that I'm redoing on my electric motorcycle right now is I thought it'd be kind of cute to put the charger in the gas cap. And I thought, well, I need some sort of special connector to do that. And I saw at the um, 
uh, the boat stores. They have these kind of neat waterproof connectors for uh, charging uh, batteries on bass boats. And they're like, I don't know, 30 bucks, something like that. And I'm not cheap, I'm frugal. <laughs> so what I thought is there's gotta be some other way of doing it. And a friend of mine recycles computers for a living. So he has you know, this huge box of dead computer power supplies. And I thought, well, those have that kind of nice connector on there. So I started to take apart the computer power supply and I cut out a piece of plastic and ground out uh, the size of that and I put that connector in there. And then I put that in the gas tank. Um, in the upper right, that is my electric car and that's got one of those bass boat connectors on there. Very similar effect when you're all done. So now all I have to do is uh, plug a computer cord into my gas tank and my electric motor, uh, motorcycle recharges. Uh, another thing we want to think about is that gas engines and electric motors kind of work at, at different RPMs. An electric motor is going to give you power from nothing. You just go and it has power. A gas engine, you have to rev it up before you get any power out of it. So they're going to do a little bit different gearing. So what I did is I did a, a mail order rear sprocket. This one's pretty big. It's 72 teeth. Um, so what I did, I called them up, I told them what I wanted to use for a chain, which was the one from Farm and Fleet for 10 bucks, not the one for 100 or 200 bucks from the motorcycle store. And when you have a big rear sprocket, that lets you change the inexpensive front sprocket to change your gearing. For example, the front sprocket, that's a $10 part. Uh, you can just go to the store and buy one of those that's got uh, 12 or 14 teeth on it. So it's a fairly good gear reduction to it. Then there's something we call the balance of system, um, which is the fancy way of saying all that other stuff. Um, there are a few other important things. I, I don't want to gloss over this, but I want to make sure to have enough time for, for questions here as well. Um, important things, a fuse. You definitely want to have a big fuse on there, and you want it to be big enough that when you're accelerating up a hill, it's not going to blow, but if there's something wrong with the electrical system, it's going to shut down all the power to the motorcycle. Because keep in mind, without that transmission and the clutch, those are ways of being able to disconnect uh, the power to the rear wheel. And since I'm directly geared on there with just a single chain, it's all done electronically, but heaven forbid something happens, you want to have safety features on there. And uh, fuses are part of that. Uh, in the upper right, that's a power disconnect key. Again, you want to make sure that that's something that is uh, rated correctly for the amperage because there are some really cheap ones of those made that uh, you wouldn't want to use. You want to use a good one. Um, in the bottom left is an ammeter. An ammeter shows amperage. And what's really cool about it is it's an instant display of how much power you're using at any time. One thing that's cool is when I'm at a stop sign, it goes to zero. An electric motorcycle does not idle. When you're stopped, you're stopped. You're not using any energy. It's a fantastic feeling. Uh, the thing in the bottom right is called a contactor. Basically, it's a big high power relay where you send a little bit of electricity to it and it flips a really big powerful switch. It's a great way to be able to turn on and off uh, power to a system. Um, and it has the ability to break. Uh, that one's rated for 400 amps. So with a 300 amp electrical system, again, it's uh, the correct sizing for it. I did a few other things on this motorcycle, and there's a few things that use energy on there. The lights. When I'm at that traffic light, the headlight is still using some energy. It's on. It's just sitting there wasting energy, but it keeps me safe because cars see my headlight on. They go, oh, hello, Mr. Motorcycle. And you're nice and safe. We can see you. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't any uh, DOT-approved affordable LED headlights right now, but there are taillights. I was at the... Uh, um, auto parts store and for a few bucks I could pick up some LED taillights so I popped one of those in there. It doesn't save a ton of energy but it's going the right direction. Also I will never ever 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 have to replace that taillight. Another thing I found is that trailers, um, those have LED lights available and I thought that kind of fits into the, the grab bar and they're pretty nice. I did eventually take that off because you would not believe how bright that thing is. Um, at night, when I would be stopped and there was a car behind me, it was always a red car. Didn't matter if it was a white car or a black car, it was a red car. So, uh, you know, after a while I took that off because I, I thought um, people behind me might appreciate not having that there. Um, another question I get a lot is about uh, registr registration and insurance and legal stuff. The truth is, it's really simple. 
People mess with motorcycles all the time. We're constantly making custom motorcycles. Try to stop somebody from customizing their motorcycle. So I have a custom motorcycle. In fact, legally, it's a hot rod. It's got a 12 horsepower motor in it, has no exhaust system on it, and it's a hot rod. Actually, when I got it, one, one uh, exhaust pipe was completely rusted off, so I just unbolted the other one and said, good, my job was already half done, thank you. Um, registration was pretty straightforward. Now, I did not get a title when I got my frame, um, which was okay, because I know in my state, it's not real hard to get a replacement title. Um, it's a little bit of paperwork, but it's not the end of the world. But that's one of those things that's different from state to state and country and province. So before you start a project like this, you're going to want to check on your registration and also call your insurance agent. I called up my insurance lady and I said, hey, I got this motorcycle, I want to take out the engine, I want to put an electric motor and batteries. And she says, okay, well, you're not messing with the safety features on there. Uh, no, I'll, I'll wear my helmet. And uh, she said, okay, so you're probably not going to be going as fast, you're probably not going to be going as far. No. She says, I have no, no problem insuring this vehicle. So I have insurance through Progressive. Um, the plates that I have on there are hobbyist plates. Um, depending on the year of your vehicle and some other things, you might be able to get a deal on registration. Like in my state, we have collector plates and hobbyist plates. And collector plates are for non-modified vehicles at least 20 years old. And what's cool about them is you only pay for the license plate once. You never have to pay for registration again. Uh, the plate itself, you, you pay double for. So you pay upfront for two years of registration and you never pay for registration again. And like I said, I'm not cheap, I'm frugal. Now there's a lot of different ways that you can do an electric motorcycle. Um, here's just a few different electric motorcycles. These all belong to friends of mine. Um, the bottom center one I think is kind of cool since it's no longer a gas tank. The guy put a voltmeter and ammeter and different instrumentation straight into the gas tank. Uh, somebody told me I should put a drink holder in my gas tank, just cut a hole, you know, s stick a Mountain Dew or some extreme beverage in there and that's place. Jolt Cola. Or, or how about an energy drink? I don't know. Um, the upper right motorcycle, that is also a Harley. Um, I saw that guy at the MREA Energy Fair and he had just started working on conversion of that. So the next year I showed up with my electric motorcycle and he was still working on the conversion of that. Uh, the bottom right one is a sport motorcycle. Uh, those actually work really well for conversions. They have fairings on them, a, a, a cover. So you take that off, you take out the engine, you put in the batteries and the motors, you put the cover back on, and nobody would even know that it's an electric motorcycle unless you tell them. Or they're like, hey, where's all the noise? And you're like, no, oh, it's electric. Um, I, I want to get to question and answer here, but um, first I'm going to... Um, I'm going to answer all the questions you're going to ask anyways because I've talked with people about this project and they always ask a couple of the same questions so we'll knock those out. Right away people ask, okay, what are the specs? It's a four battery 48 volt system. It has a 20 to 30 mile range depending on how much of a lead foot I want to be that day, uh, weather, terrain, hills, that sort of thing. Top speed is 45 miles an hour. That's the speed limit right outside my house and I have gotten a speeding ticket in an electric vehicle and I do not need another. Now, if I changed out that front sprocket, I'd be able to change the top speed. So if I wanted something, I would go 55 or 65 miles an hour. I could do that. I'd give up a little acceleration in exchange for the top speed. Uh, charging is under eight hours, and it has excellent acceleration. Another question people like to ask is, aren't electric motorcycles too quiet? You're going to get killed on that thing. Loud pipes save lives. Well, it's, it's not silent. It has chain noise. It has the noise of the rubber on the road. It has the, the noise of the wind going around me. So it's, it's not silent. You will definitely hear it, but it's not loud either. And if you still think it's too quiet, I'll show you what to do. You get an iPod and you get some of these self-powered computer speakers where you put a couple of batteries in there. Then you load up sound effects on the iPod. I had a Harley, I had a Buell, I had a 1000 CC, I had a 50 CC. I had the George Jetson flying car sound. <laughs> I was leaving work one day and there were a couple of Hurley guys sitting off to the side. So I hop on my bike, I turn it on, boop, hit the button. Potato, 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 potato. <laughs> hey guys, boop. <laughs> and these are big burly biker guys. I'm like, oh, it's, it's an electric motorcycle. What do you think? And they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Mine's always overheating in this weather. Yeah, well, mine doesn't have a radiator on it either. 
<laughs> Another question people ask me is, if it's electric, why do you still have the gas tank? It looks cool. Just my honest opinion, an electric motorcycle without a gas tank looks dumb. It just does. It just does. You don't see a gas tank on a car. On a motorcycle, you see it, and it's an intrinsic part of what a motorcycle is, whether it's gas or electric. I'm sticking with keeping the gas tank on there. Uh, right now I'm working on the gas tank. I'm going to add the ammeter in there. I got the paint stripped off. It makes an excellent cover for the batteries. It's a great place to put my ammeter. And it kind of covers up my wires and everything. So here's a motorcycle without a gas tank on it. And here's one with a gas tank on it. I think it looks nicer with a gas tank. One more question is people ask me, could you build an electric car? My answer to that one is can and did. And I built that after the motorcycle, and I built it for less money, because now I knew what I was doing. So instead of a $500 motor, I put a $50 forklift motor in there. The entire project was $1,300. And actually what I'm doing now is teaching people how to build their own electric cars. Uh, I run a web page called 300mpg.org. If you're interested in this sort of thing, please visit the web page. Hopefully I can help answer some of your questions there. But while you have me here in the flesh, um, we've got a few minutes left for some questions, so please. What do you want to know about this? How much did your motorcycle cost? The motorcycle was about $2,000 total. That's including buying the frame, buying the batteries, all the parts, uh, registration, a motorcycle safety class, and a year of insurance. The single biggest cost on that was the batteries. I bought those brand new. Uh, they were very nice high-end batteries, um, but they were like 200 bucks each. They were really my, my big splurge on the project. Uh, guys have built very inexpensive motorcycles. I know one, one guy who, uh, he got an electric forklift from his work that they were getting rid of. It was just old. He just took it apart, reassembled it into a motorcycle, b built a motorcycle for free. Um, I, I don't need it. Yes? If you change that front spark sprocket to, uh, be, to get your higher mile, uh, speed, would that impact your range? Uh, the question is on changing the gearing, if that's going to affect the range. Uh, more likely than not, it probably would, because what's going to happen with a, a setup for a higher top speed is it's going to require more amperage because that gear reduction for pulling away from uh, from stop signs. So I, I think more than anything it would depend on how I drive. If I was just driving continuously, um, it probably wouldn't make a difference. But if I was in a lot of kind of start and stop driving situations, a lower gear would be advantageous. Um, I live two miles outside of a city of 11,000 people. It's all 25 mile an hour roads there and a lot of stop signs. So I geared my motorcycle nice and low because it's got great acceleration away from uh, stop signs and traffic lights. I just put new tires on my motorcycle. Um, the ones that came with the frame were kind of uh, worn out. Um, I went over to a, a new friend's place uh, two weekends ago, put some new tires on there. I bought the tires on sale when there was a, a closeout sale at my local uh, motorcycle store. Uh, tires were 40 bucks each. Normally you'd have to pay about that much to have some professional put them on for you. My friend and I put them on ourselves and I saved the 80 bucks that way. Ah, weight of the motorcycle. Um, I forgot to mention it, but before you take the motorcycle apart, that's a great time to weigh it. If you have, for example, like a landscaping company near you with one of those big drive up scales for the trucks, put your vehicle on there, get it weighed, and then after the conversion, you can uh, take it back and see what the difference is. Um, I've never actually weighed mine. It's a little heavier than it was uh, as a gasoline vehicle. Not by a lot, though. And the center of gravity is actually very, very good. Um, it, it steers and leans and corners and goes over bumps uh, just exactly the way that it should. Are there any braking issues with the added weight? Does it uh, take longer to stop or anything like that? Uh, the braking is really, really no different. Um, most motorcycles have pretty darn good brakes on them. Um, I've got a front uh, disc brake on this. It's just a single disc. A lot of motorcycles now, especially the sport bikes, have double disc brakes on the front. That's another great thing about the sport bikes is they're designed to accelerate really fast and brake really fast. So um, if you have a little additional weight, having the double brakes is, is nice. It's, it's really designed to be able to stop on a dime like that.
Yeah. Uh, you don't use a regenerative brake I do not use regenerative brakes on the motorcycle. Um, that electric motor could be used as a generator. Uh, but to do that, I'd need a different controller on there. The, the one brand that's somewhat affordable that supports regenerative braking doesn't have a very good track record. Um, people just haven't had good luck with them. Uh, the other thing is when you brake on a motorcycle, what you're mostly doing is you brake with the front wheel. If you lock up the back wheel on a motorcycle, your motorcycle scoots out from underneath you. It's a great way to, to get into an accident. Um, and I, I didn't think I, I wanted to mess with anything like that. Uh, regenerative braking can give you a little bit um, better range. Uh, typically 10 to 15 percent are the numbers we usually hear. So if I've got a vehicle designed to go 20 or 30 miles on a charge and I add 10 to 15 percent on there, two or three miles extra for the additional cost of a different controller and really having to tweak it to make sure I, I never have any problems with that back brake, I, I just figured not to mess with it. Rain and the electric motors. Um, I'm a wuss. I really don't drive in the rain. Um, my electric car, I drive in the rain. It's great. I actually made a YouTube video called Electric Car Goes Through Car Wash because people have this mentality that anything electric will obviously electrocute you. Um, my, my wife's coworkers asked her one time, she's like, really, your husband has an electric car, an electric motorcycle? Does he get electrocuted? Can he drive it in the rain? Yeah, you can, you can drive it in the rain. Um, most of the components are kind of under the seat, under the gas tank. They're, they're relatively protected from the elements. Um, I wouldn't want to leave it out in the rain, even just like, like a regular motorcycle. You don't want to do that. You know, the switches corrode and that sort of a thing. But no, it, there's, there's really no issues with it. Um, you can actually run electric batteries underwater if you want. There's a lot of things you can do with them that, that people don't think of. But right back there. How much does it cost in electricity and how often do you have to replace the batteries? I built this motorcycle uh, three years ago now. Um, it's the same batteries. They work great. Um, I take care to charge them up right after I'm done riding. That helps keep your batteries happy, gives them a nice long life. Um, these batteries should last years and years. Um, I'm, I'm not beating on them every day. I've uh, been really happy with them. Uh, it costs about a penny a mile to ride this. So if I go out 20 miles, that's about 20 cents. It's very inexpensive. Um, I just got my electric bill the other day. Last month's electric bill was $45, and that includes charging an electric motorcycle, charging an electric car, and paying three bucks extra to get renewable energy over the grid instead of coal power from the grid. Back there. Yeah, I have uh, information on both uh, the electric car and the motorcycle there. I also, I made an instructional DVD about the car, and I have, uh, uh, that's available through the website. Actually, they've got it at the bookstore right here, too, called Build Your Own Electric Car Cheap, and I'm working on an instructional DVD teaching people how to build an electric motorcycle as well. Oh, I'm sorry? I have an instructional DVD set at the bookstore. It's a two-disc set uh, showing you how to build an electric car. And a lot of the things between an electric motorcycle and electric car are, are very similar. It's a, it's a great overview of uh, doing something yourself, doing it affordable, learn how to do it. So. Building a quad. Um, no. I mean, that's, that's my electric car. It's got four wheels on. It's got room for my wife and my baby. It's got room for groceries, daytime running lights, uh, driver and passenger airbags. The motorcycle's just a lot of fun to ride, though. What kind of range are you getting on your car, uh, The car is only running on six batteries, and they're used batteries. I bought them for 12 bucks each. On just the six-battery system, it's not designed for any more than 20 miles, but I live two miles outside of town, so uh, you know, technically it's overkill. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to put uh, a little money into getting some new batteries on it, and then I'll be able to go pretty fast and considerably further with some new batteries on it. How much did it cost you to redo your car? Uh, the car was a $1,300 project, including buying the car in the first place. I bought that for 500 bucks, sold 500 bucks worth of parts out of it, bought a $50 forklift motor, bought a pile of used batteries for 12 bucks each. 
Um, it was a very affordable project, but it was also an exercise in recycling and salvage as well. Does making it electric affect the steering of the motorcycle? No, the motorcycle on electric steers um, exactly the same, same way that it was a, would as gas. Um, another thing on a motorcycle that's different than a car is um, accelerating makes the motorcycle stand up straight. So uh, let's say you're doing a slow speed turn, you kind of miscalculated and it's kind of leaning over a little bit, you just accelerate and the motorcycle stands right back up. So the ability to quickly accelerate on a motorcycle is, is an important feature. Uh, mine works really great that way and it's, it's kind of neat. And I'm not an expert motorcycle rider, this is my first motorcycle ever, but it's pretty cool how uh, it just responds so instantly. Uh, motorcycles are a lot of fun that way. The way y y you don't even steer, you just kind of lean and push and it, whoo, 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 you know, like, like in that movie Tron, it's, it's, it's like that other than the 90 degree turns. It, it feels just like it though. Right back there. What kind of batteries are in the car? Are they lead acid? Uh, yeah, those are just used lead acid batteries in the car. Nothing fancy at all. It's, it's not space age technology. It's 100 year old technology. Everybody's got a lead acid battery in their gasoline car. Kind of just the same thing. Did you do anything to them, like change the acid out? Or no, and, the, and those are sealed batteries, so in that oh. case you can't even change the acid out. I think my time's done, but let's go for one more question. Who's got the best question? <laughs> See, yeah, but you put your hand down. I'm like, I got it. No, it's not that good, really. It's, I, I got nothing. Up here, this guy's got a question. Can a forklift motor be used for any kind of car? Can a forklift motor be used for any kind of car? Um, I've seen them used for dragsters. Um, got a couple of friends putting some forklift motors into uh, pickup trucks. Um, I had this crazy idea about getting a pair of matched forklift motors, connecting them to each other, and then to the differential in the car, and make a make a junkyard fire breathing, rubber burning kind of a vehicle. It's it's amazing the torque, and you know, literally, there's forklifts sitting in junkyards right now. And I think in the future, you know, gas prices are going to keep going up. We're going to live in a future that has less energy than we do now. And we're not going to be able to just go out and manufacture fancy new eco things. We're going to have to learn how to do things for ourselves. And we're going to have to be smart. We're going to have to have skills. And we're going to have to be more dependent on each other. And I think doing a project like this is great that way. I've made a lot of friends and learned a lot of things working on a project like this. And I highly encourage you to go out there and do the same. Because <clears throat> if I can build an electric motorcycle, you sure can. Thank you. Thank you.